Cottonmouth versus Copperhead. Who's the biggest? Who's the baddest? Let's talk about these two iconic snakes. Hey you guys, welcome back to Venom Central. We almost didn't do a video this week. Um, it's, it's been a tough week for me. I, I, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, it's, it, it's been one for the books. Um, I had the death of my family this week, so it put a, it, it put a damper on my mood. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you, um, if some of my loyal followers, I know you guys read the comments and you guys go through them, and you've probably seen my sister's comments in there. And she goes by a couple different names. She went by a couple different names. She went by Chris Beard. And that's just my sister. Her name was Jeannie. Um, she, she she was uh, near and dear to my heart. And, and, and we just lost her this week. And, uh, and I'll tell you, um, just to tell you a little bit about Jeannie, she was she was a tough chick <laughs> i mean god bless her but let me tell you something um she can fight like a man she can party like a rock star and she can be as sweet and as loving as as an old grandma Jeannie, this one's for you babe i love you and and god we're gonna miss you hey i want to give a big thank you to some of my supporters patrick mullahan thank you brother i i don't know what else to say man you are you're one of our main supporters, along with Stephen Stewart Music. Stephen, thank you so much, bro. It, it's a big help here feeding my animals. And I want to send a special thank you to a new supporter who's been following us, and they and they just took it to the next level, and they're they're they've joined the Venom Squad as family. But Kevin and Trisha Goldman, thank you so much for your generous donation. And so let's get busy because we got a lot to do today. We're going to talk about the copperhead and the cotton mouth, and I got a couple live ones on set, so we can compare them, and we're going to talk about care, we're going to talk about who's meaner, who's better captive, we're going to hit on all kinds of stuff. We're going to try to have some fun today. The Keystradon, I mean, our native pit vipers here to the States, I mean, they're, I mean, they're just two iconic snakes, you know. And I've had this idea for a while, I just haven't really had an opportunity to get out and go collect a couple. Because I want to have a couple live specimens to compare and show you guys. And I used to keep copperheads and breed them. I used to keep cotton mouths and breed them. I used to do albinos. So I got a couple specimens for in-house. And then we'll release them when we're done with this video. And we'll put them right back where we found them. To get on with it today, we're going to talk about, you know, the difference in these two species. And they are iconic, you know, because when anybody hears the word copperhead, it's like, Yep, they smell like cucumbers. <laughs> or, you know, when they hear a uh, cottonmouth or a water moccasin, it's like, yep, I had one chase me when I was fishing. Or, you know, well, we're going to hit on all that. We're going we're gonna to talk about, we're going to bust the myth from and the thing. We're going to talk about the legendary status of both these animals. And we're going to show the comparisons of them. We're going to talk about captive care of each species also in captivity for you snake guys. And uh, which one does better and feeding and venom. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. So this one might be a long video, but we're going to have fun guys. And I wasn't going to do a video this week, but I needed to do this video this week. I, I, I needed it. I just, I, I need to do this for my mind this week, guys, and I need my Venom Squad and my wife and my supporters, but uh, we're going to get with it and we're going to have some fun today. No matter what the circumstance of the world is, Venom Central is going to be here for you. So let's get busy with it, y'all. We were able to go out this week and collect a copperhead, which was very easy, and I hunted hard and could not find a damn moccasin. I couldn't find a cottonmouth this week. Normally I'm hooking these things and moving them out of the road on a daily basis. For some reason I couldn't find one this week. So my buddy Blake turned up one for me. But when we're done with these animals, they will be released right back where we found them and back in the wild. But I wanted to have a couple specimens here on set to do the comparison for you guys. And the funny thing about, now these are snakes, we call it the Keystradon complex. And there's a lot of a Keystradon, but here in the States, we have two species of Echestrodon, okay? We've got our Echestrodon contortrix, which is your copperhead, which there's like four to five subspecies of copperheads. And then we got your Echestrodon piscivorus. Piscivorus is the moccasin or the cottonmouth, which there's actually three subspecies of moccasin, 
but I think the taxonomist may have changed it. I'm not sure. I haven't kept up on it. It might be that they're they're just eastern and western now. But anyways, they were eastern cottonmouth and then Florida cottonmouth and the western cottonmouth. We're going to pull this one out so you guys get a good look at it. I'm going to show you some of the distincting factors that separates these guys and how to identify and just all the characteristics of a true water moccasin, aka cottonmouth. But what's cool about the cottonmouth is its name, okay? Like your your copperheads are a Keystradon contortrix, okay? But these guys are a Keystradon piscivorus. That's the second name in their scientific name. And piscivorus means fish eater, okay? Which they are, they're big fish eaters. But uh, I'm gonna pull this guy out. We're gonna talk a little bit about cottonmouths. Now, I'm hoping this guy don't chase me around the room <laughs> because they do that. <laughs> now that is one of the one of the myths about these guys, and let me tell you, it is completely not true. But let me tell you first, we're going to start out with behavior, okay? Now, moccasins. When you first encounter a moccasin in the wild, and if you get too close to it, nine out of ten times. It will hold its ground, coil up, and they do a behavior we call gaping. He'll get in a coil just like he is there, and he'll throw his mouth open and show you that interior of his mouth, that, that white mouth. And they'll gape, and they'll hold their mouth open, and they'll hold their head up high, and they'll do it twitching their heads. And we call it gaping. It's a, it's, a, it's a defensive posture. It's like, look at my mouth. I got big fangs. I'll hurt you. And, no, you ain't going to hurt me, buddy. <laughs> get back over there. There we go. But what's cool about the moccasins, they calm down very quickly, okay? I mean, literally, like this snake was in the wild yesterday. And look at it. It's just content to coil up there and just chill out. You know what I mean? But copperheads are a different story. They're more flighty. They're actually meaner. They're, they can be cheeky little some bitches, okay? Copperheads are a different animal when it comes to behavior. And copperheads will repeat a strike. And moccasins tend to just kind of be chill. Now, when you first encounter them, that's the behavior you're going to see, the gaping. And they'll defend themselves when they need to. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they'll, they'll damn sure bite you. But um, I think it was Wick Gibbons did the, uh, did the experiment with the, with the tongs and a glove showing like a hand and actually grabbing them and picking them up. And they're not even biting. But they will bite. Don't let that like deter you to think that they're not going to bite you because if he feels that threatened like something's over, going to overpower him or eat him or you know make a meal out of him he'll bite you back to their name piscivorus it's latin for you know it means fish eater because this is the only semi-aquatic pit viper here in the states okay these guys spend a lot of time in water and that's where you normally find them near a water source swamps ponds creeks lakes you know and they got a good range down here in the southeast. They range all through the southeast, all the way over to the west as far as Texas. Fish is a big part of their diet. But I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to being king of the swamp, okay, this guy's it. This guy is the true king of the swamp, okay? Everybody thinks the alligator is the king of the swamp. It's the moccasin. These things eat anything. Anything they can overpower, anything that they can choke down, they're going to eat it. I mean, I have seen moccasins eat such an array of things. They'll eat roadkill. I've seen them eating roadkill frogs. I've seen them eating roadkill birds. Um, I caught one one time several years ago, just a, a pretty good size one, like a four footer. And it got so upset during the capture and I wanted to stage it for some photos. It regurgitated a pine snake, a damn pine snake, a snake that you normally don't see too often anymore. And I'll tell you, it's just, they are ophidious. They'll eat other snakes with no problem. These guys will eat baby alligators. They'll eat turtles. They'll eat fish. I actually done my own study on baby moccasins. And funny story because me and my buddy, Dean Repo, I was working at the Serpentarium, and he comes down to grab me. He goes, Willie, let's just run out to the swamp today and spend the day herping, you know? And I'm like, I got work to do, man. This, you know, I got to get caught up with this stuff. And he's like, oh, it can hold. Just let's just go out today. I really want to get out of here. 
So we end up running out to the swamp. And he goes, well, you want your gravid moccasin for your study, right? I'm like, yeah, if, if, if we find one, you know. So I don't have no gear. I got nothing with me. He gives me a pair of his rubber boots. Uh, I take a couple hooks from the damn Serpentarium and, and we head out, right? So we're... We're in some muck up to our chest. And I mean, he's dragging me all through this damn swamp. And he's like, you go this way and I'm gonna go this way. <laughs> Dean was a character. I miss him, he was my pal. But let me tell you, we get separated. And I said, well, let's just stay in earshot of each other, okay? So every 20, 30 minutes, and we're both creeping through this massive swamp, which you can get lost in it very easy. We'd yell out to each other just so we'd stay in distance of each other. Now, mind you, Dean doesn't have a damn snake hook with him. I'm like, you want to take a hook? He's, no, nah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need one. I'm just going to look and think. I go, well, if we see what we want. I want to grab a female because I want some, some babies for this study I want to do. So we're out a couple hours, right? I hear him yelling my name, Willie, Willie. <laughs> so I'm yelling back to him, and I can't see him. I'm like... Just keep screaming so I can follow your voice. And it took me about 35 minutes to work my way over to where he's at, right? I get about 30 yards from him and see where he's at. And he's standing in muck up to his damn waist, right? With a moccasin in each hand like this. He's got one neck here and one neck here. And they're dangling and flopping around. And I just look at him like he doesn't have a snake hook. He's, he's got nothing. He's like, hey, I got a couple gravid females. Now, mind you, these things are only about this long. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, there's no way they were gravid females. I get closer. I go, they look a little chubby. I go, first of all, how in the frick did you accomplish that? How did you do that? <laughs> and Dean, in his own way, he's like, well, I just reached down real gently and picked one up behind the head and and then I seen the other one. He goes, so I kind of walked over there and put my boot on that one real gently and reached out and picked it up. And he's got two of them like this. <laughs> I mean, it was comical. But anyways, Dean assured me, he goes, I'm telling you, both these snakes are gravid. He goes, and, and I'm looking at them and they're only about this long. They're a lot smaller than this. And I said, well, I only need one. I just need several babies for what I want to do. So I pick one out. He goes, I'm telling you, it's gravid. Now I'm, I'm thinking there's no way that that snake's maybe last year's baby. They mature quickly. They mature quickly. And he was right. That snake gave me nine babies. So the study I did, I did on keister non feeding behavior, but I wanted to take several of the babies and feed them all different food sources, all right? Just because I wanted to give one nothing but fish, nothing but fish. I wanted to give another one fish and frogs, and then give the other set of them rodents. And believe it or not, the ones that ate fish, just fish, did better than all the other ones. They grew quicker, they had better weight gains, they were more vibrant, they were just healthier, bigger babies. They, they, they grew in leaps and bounds. And true to the name, Piscovorus, fish eater. So I'll tell you, these guys possibly can mature within three years old and that's quick for a pit viper and now let me tell you now when it comes to size for these things they can get big they can get big i mean the biggest one i have ever seen in my life was in hyde county north carolina um and it was actually crossing it, it was dead it was it, it was a road kill right on 94 and this this road splits lake mad and mesquite and literally this this thing was massive. It was every bit of five and a half, probably six foot. It was this big around. It looked like a python laying in a road. And I, to this day, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just a monster. And I've caught some big ones. I've caught some that were, you know, four and a half to five foot, big heavy body ones, you know. But you just don't see them like that no more. You just don't see them big monsters no more. This is the norm now. This size is what most guys would consider that's a pretty big adult moccasin. But anyways, when it comes to food, moccasins eat everything. They are very opportunistic. I mean, they'll eat a rattlesnake, they'll eat, they'll overpower each other, they'll eat each other, they'll eat baby gators, they'll eat anything they can they can find. They'll eat carrion. They're very opportunistic. These are the true kings of the swamp. 
And now finding these things, you're normally going to encounter moccasins somewhere near a water source. They like swampy conditions. They like the water source, okay? Versus the copperhead. Now, copperheads, they're not that picky or choosy. They will make home out of anywhere they land. Them things, I mean, I've found moccasins and copperheads under the same piece of tin. I found them under the same log. And you would think copperheads would be like a, more of a, you know, okay, they're more of a drier species. They'd be more of an upland species. No, they inhabit everywhere. I mean, they do really well in an urban setting. I mean, I, I find them right here in my neighborhood. I mean, literally crossing the road. I, I take them out of people's yards all the time. Um, they're, they're a really prolific snake also. Moccasin versus copperhead when it comes to babies, they're both very prolific. They have babies constantly. Now, of course, we've got the studies going on with the copperheads and the, and the asexual and the, the virgin births and, and all of that stuff. And, that, and that's we haven't found that out about these guys yet, but they're both very prolific animals. But when it comes to the body of this animal, now a moccasin, the head size of these things, their heads are massive. I mean, look at the head on this rascal. I mean, that thing has got a big, buffy head. I mean, it is a thick head. It is monstrous. They got a big head. And they got, now, what's cool about, you know, your Keystone species is they got them in large scales on their head, sort of like what a non-venomous snake would have, okay? And telling these from a non-venomous snake, I mean, most people say, well, you can look at the anal scoot and tell one's, one's divided, one ain't. No, who's going to get that close to look at that? If you're not a snake guy you know your dead giveaways is you know if you can see the pupil your keystone is going to have that vertical pupil look at the head the way it, it separates from the neck it's, it's it's very erupt the heads are big buffy heart shaped and now this more so than than the contortrix than your copper heads when they're swimming in the water i'm going to tell you what the dead giveaway is between this and a non-venomous water snake when you see a non-venomous water snake swimming its body will be submerged. It won't be floating. Its body will be submerged, swimming with just its head out of the water and doing its thing, okay? When you see a moccasin in the water swimming, his whole body's floating. They actually float themselves and they swim. They swim similar to we do. They float themselves and swim on the top of the water. To whereas a damn water snake, your Neurodia species, their body is a few inches under the water line swimming. These guys, always on top of the water. When you see that, you know it's a moccasin. But my suggestion is you don't get too damn close to be able to try to tell the difference anyways. If you don't know what you're looking at, don't mess with it. But anyways, the moccasin is such a cool snake, but when it gets to captivity, okay, these guys calm down really well. They do, like, like I said, this snake was in the wild yesterday. They calm down, their demeanor changes, they actually become very chill. This snake is content to just sit there and look at me. It's not going to chase me. That's that's crazy. You're not going to have a nest of cotton mouse chase you. And if a snake is coming in your direction, it's just it's not chasing you. It's trying to get away from you, and it's going towards a water source or going towards a, a source where it can go hide. So they don't chase you. That's total baloney. Okay. But another cool thing about the moccasin, their size. They get massive. Okay, guys, I'm going to stretch this snake out a little bit. He's been laying there in a nice tight coil. Because I want you to kind of see. Now, even though this, this specimen is really dark, okay, it is. But you can notice them faint bands on him, okay. And the underbelly has some beautiful markings also. But you can notice these big faint bands on them. Now, as babies, they're really banded up. Telling a baby moccasin from a baby copperhead to a novice is kind of difficult. Okay, because they look really similar. But the dead giveaway is the head. The head on a baby moccasin is huge. They're they're like all head, you know. And the baby copperheads have a much smaller head. And, of course, the copperheads are going to have that hourglass pattern. And the moccasins are going to have a big, heavy banding pattern. But... These guys in the wild, they can be variable, okay? They can really be variable. I mean, this is a darker specimen. Now, I've, I've found them. I've seen them anywhere from, from like almost a cream yellow color with dark brown bandings on them to tan to grayish 
to almost green. They can be really variable. Not all moccasins are just black, you know. But, um, and you'll notice this one has still got them faint bands. But I used to keep moccasins. I used to actually keep albinos um, back. This was 15 years ago, maybe longer. So they can be really variable. I'm going to have Dina put a picture in of a moccasin that I caught a few years ago. It was on a nuisance removal. And it was a big one. It was a four and a half footer. It was a, he was probably pushing five and he was yellow. He was yellow and cream colored and had these big brown bands. He was gorgeous, but he was a monster. Um, I got a call and I went to go respond to this call and it was at a boat marina and this moccasin was coiled up on somebody, on the bow of somebody's boat, an actual, uh, a pontoon boat. He was up there like he owned a damn boat. I mean, <laughs> these people were like, we want to go out on the boat, but that is our problem and i caught him and he didn't even gape at me he was just like yeah okay he was chill put him in a a, a big bag and took him out of there and uh, i got a picture of him because i had him here at Venom central for a couple of days and i gave him to a nature center there is leucistics out there there's there's guys working with leucistic moccasins that are white with with, with dark eyes there's albinos so they're coming in some morphs you know but moccasins in in captivity now wild caught ones they don't fare well they for some reason they just they just don't seem to do very well if you get them when they're small enough they seem to do good but as an adult they just never take to it even though they do calm down and chill out and and and, and relax it's just they're so used to being having a big water source to but also to be able to stay dry and that's the mistake a lot of keepers make keeping moccasins is they think that, okay, it's a water snake. we got to keep it in water and, and give it a big water source. I've seen moccasins get water blisters, which, you know, they're a semi-aquatic snake. So that don't mean that they're like a sea snake that can just take water constantly. They actually get up off the water more than half their lives and get on dry substrate. So, but they don't do that well versus the copperheads. Copperheads thrive i mean you can catch a copperhead and he'll eat in a damn bucket 10 minutes later i mean they just do well you know so if you're gonna lean toward getting a moccasin for whatever reason for a nature center or for for your own personal collection or whatever the reason may be try to get a captive born one or try to get a smaller one because then they seem to do better but i'll tell you something um they are variable and it can be very very pretty I mean, this one's is in its dark phase, okay? But I've seen some moccasins that'll knock your eyes out, okay? But anyways, the water moccasin, the cotton mouth, whatever you like to call it, I call them moccasins. But let me tell you something else about this now. As placid as this snake is, okay, and as calm as this snake is, this snake's no joke, all right? This snake, this little rascal right here, he's got a pretty potent venom when it comes to comparing it to a copperhead copperhead bites are known to be kind of mild you know and very very rarely fatal moccasin bites are very rarely fatal but the big game changer with the keistrodon piscivorus versus the keistrodon contortrix is literally this guy is cytotoxic bites usually end up with some kind of amputation or end up with severe tissue damage i mean that's a game changer and what's weird is bites from these guys there's no like systemic signs there's i mean you, you don't have that anaphylactic shock thing that goes on like with a copperhead bite or you know you just start pain fire rotting okay wherever you're bit you know I mean, I don't know. None of my friends have been tagged by a moccasin. Well, Dean got tagged by a moccasin when he was like 13. <laughs> That's why when I seen him sitting there holding to him like this, I was like, dude, didn't you learn your lesson? <laughs> you know? But that's just Dean. He would do that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. It's a bad bite. It's a serious bite, and it's a bad bite. And just because they're placid and they're chill, when you first encounter them, they ain't like that. They're, they're a little cheeky, but they calm down quickly. But it's a very toxic bite. It's it's nothing to play with. And I know you've probably seen the videos of guys with these things where they scoop them and pick them up and hold them like this. And the snake's coiled up like that. But I'm going to tell you something. The wrong move, that snake's going to hit you. 
and you may have seen the video. I think I, th I think it was Wake Gibbons that did that video with with the uh, the mechanical hand and showing just how reluctant they are to bite. But you know what? Put some heat on that hand, okay? Warm that thing up where this thing something where where he's gonna think that something live is grabbing him. Maybe like uh you know heat it up to body temperature and then try it and we might get a different outcome. He may just light that hand up. You know what I mean? I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I'm gonna try that and see if it works. Well, I'm gonna try it with a glove and just room temperature, then I'm gonna heat it up with a damn blow dryer and then see how he reacts. That might be a good experiment, but the water moxin, it's a cool snake, dens in the swamp, but he's a serious player. I think they're kings of the swamp. But anyways, we're gonna put him back and we're gonna pull out a copperhead. And we're gonna show you the difference in behavior, the difference in what they look like, and all that stuff that entails. Okay, next guys, we're gonna pull out uh, a copperhead. Now this is the southern copperhead, okay? Um, like I said, there, there's four to five different subspecies of copperhead, but like I said, I think the taxonomist turned them all into one. But anyways, it turned a copperhead to copperhead, damn it. But I just wanna show you real quickly the difference in behavior. Now, this snake is not going to cooperate. It's going to be all over the place. Copperheads are normally really squirrely. They don't <laughs> they don't tolerate being uh, table topped, and he's going to be perpetual motion. But I want you to see. Look at the difference in the size. Now, this is an adult specimen. Okay, this is actually an adult male too, and this isn't a real big one. Now, copperheads, but notice notice the banding. Okay. Nothing like a water moccasin, okay? He's got these hourglass type chevrons on him and the coloring is actually completely different. And copperheads are variable too. They can come in an array of different colors and stuff. But let me tell you, see, I wish we had smell vision right now because this snake is just musted. And now this is where that old thing comes with copperheads. Oh, they kind of smell like cucumbers. and They do have a smell it does to me it doesn't smell like cucumbers it's very musty and it smells bad like my wife's over there kind of cringing her nose up right now <laughs> but they have a funky smell and all the keistrodons do it that moccasin he can do the same thing but he was so laid back he didn't must okay but this one's already done it and it smells horrible but now the difference between this guy and that guy the venom is a big difference okay but look at the head size. He's got he's got a little head on him compared to a moccasin. I mean, he's got he's got a peanut head compared to that moccasin, okay? And even a moccasin, I'm sorry, even a copperhead that is 40 inches is still not going to have a head nor near the size of a of a cottonmouth. But you can clearly see the difference in appearance. Big difference in appearance, and there's a big difference in venom, okay? So, when it comes to captive care, now Copperheads thrive in captivity. Like this snake, I bet you, you know what? I'm gonna try it. Now this snake has literally just been here for a couple days. I bet you I could put this snake in that tub and it'd eat. It'd kill a mouse and eat it. These things just, they just do well in captivity. That's why they make such a good first hot. If you're planning on venturing into the hot hobby or, 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 or the, the aspects of herpetology that require venomous keeping. This is a good starter, okay? I mean, the venom's not deadly, deadly where it's going to kill you. It's going to hurt you, make you probably wish you were dead, but they thrive. And and you know what's cool about these things is there is morphs. I mean, there are so many cool morphs that guys are that guys are doing with a Keystradon Contortrix right now. And literally, uh, a buddy of mine, Chris, um, he works really heavy with copperheads and... Uh, and he sent me some pictures of some of his morphs. I mean, he's got he's got them that are completely patternless. Um, we're gonna pop some pictures of them. He's got a, a, a morph of uh, of copperhead that uh, they call it the camel pattern. Okay, it almost looks like old army camouflage pattern, and it's really slick looking. But he's got some pretty cool morphs. But the one that takes the cake, um, I'll tell you, uh, a guy that I follow on Instagram. Daniel Jarvis, he's got probably the only leucistic copperhead in the world. 
I mean, when you look at this picture, we're going to pop a picture in there of this thing. It is, Daniel calls it his unicorn. And I, I tell you, Daniel, that's a cool snake, brother. I mean, it is awesome. This thing is snow white with blue eyes. Can you imagine that? A copperhead snow white with blue eyes. Check out Daniel's Instagram page. We'll put a link to it. Um, but uh, these guys do really well. They breed readily in captivity. Um, mature age, usually three to four years old. They may breed younger. I've heard of them breeding at 18 months, okay? But I'll tell you, they do good in captivity and very simple to keep. You can go back to some of my old videos and I do care, care videos on these guys. But um, yes, they do have a smell. It's, it's not cucumbery. It's 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 stanky. Okay, it stanks. But uh, you can tell the difference in behavior now. Now I'll tell you when you first get up on a copperhead in the wild, they're nothing like a moccasin. They're not going to hold their ground. They're going to try to bolt. They try to get away from you immediately. And when they figure out that they can't get away from you, and then they do repeated strikes, rattling their tail, repeated strikes. They get cheeky. They get downright mean. And it takes these guys a little bit longer to calm down. Okay? Moccasins calm down pretty quickly. But these guys, it takes them, takes them a minute. But they just do really well in captivity. But anyways, the difference is, look at that. I mean, that's a total different animal. Same Akistradon, same complex. But this guy can live anywhere. You can put these guys anywhere and they'll thrive. And they're an opportunistic feeder too. I mean, a neat thing that I seen with with uh, with copperheads was literally uh, there were cicadas hatching, right? And and uh, and this was when I was up in North Carolina. We found um, we found a tree, <laughs> right, where cicadas were coming out of the ground and getting up to this tree. There was like 15 copperheads around the base of that tree, and they were waiting on the cicadas and they were eating them. I mean, it's, it was crazy. It was like they knew it was happening, and they eat cicadas. They love them. But uh, they'll eat frogs. They'll eat mice. They, they do really well in captivity on a diet of mice. But they'll eat almost anything also. But they're not ophidious like the moccasins are. Cottonmouths are damn ophidious. They'll eat, they'll eat up snakes. But, uh, but they make good captives. So, but to tell the difference... I mean, that's pretty evident. You can look at that snake and go, yeah, he looks nothing like a damn cottonmouth. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, we're gonna, you know what, I'm gonna feed this thing. I, I bet you this little sucker will eat a mouse right now. I'm gonna put him in this bin and throw a mouse in there. I bet you he eats it. And what's cool about copperheads is they have got a venom that knocks mice down like quickly. I mean, they're just, for some reason, that works really well on on rodents. But uh, I'm going to put him in there to keep him from squirreling around out here. And uh, I'm going to pop a mouse in there. Let's see if he eats. Hey, guys, before we feed this copperhead, before, before we see if it eats, I think it's going to eat. Um, Dina has something that she's really passionate about. And, and I've convinced her to to do some YouTube videos. Dean has got a legal background. She's got, you know, she, she was a paralegal for a long time. And she's been following this for several years. And it's called the Innocence Network. People that have been wrongfully accused, wrongfully imprisoned for crimes that they didn't commit. I mean, there's some freaking horror stories. I mean, when she started hipping me to this stuff, I'm just like disgusted. And I mean, just showing how crooked our justice system can be. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. But I talked her into doing a couple videos and started her own little channel. She's helping share this information, and that's what the Innocence Network is about: is sharing this information so everybody worldwide can pitch in and help. And you guys go over and give Miss Dina some love and watch these videos. I mean, it's it's some disturbing stuff. We're gonna put a link to her to her new channel that she just started, and go over and watch some of these videos. Check out. Her channel is called The Reckoning with Dina K. Check it out. Okay, we're gonna pop a live mouse in with this with this fresh uh, copperhead. And let's see. I'll bet you I'll bet you he eats this mouse. These things do so well in captivity, it's not even funny. They just they just thrive under any circumstance. They're just a very hardy snake.
I don't know if the lights are going to spook him, but we'll see. I bet you he eats it. That mouse is froze up there. But I tell you what's 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 neat about this this particular subspecies of copperhead. This is one of the, what we would call the nominate race. This is this is the Echisodon. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Um, this is the Contortrix. Contortrix. This is the southern copperhead, which is the one that resides here in South Carolina. And uh, let me tell you, um, this snake is of pretty significant medical importance right now. I mean, they're doing a bunch of different studies with this with this little guy's venom. Okay, and it's it, it's not it it's not in trials yet but but they're doing these studies on mice um you know now this guy's venom it's it's a hemotoxic venom it's not as potent as the water moccasin but oh he's he's gonna pop it and you know which the water moccasin has 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 a damn cytotoxic i mean it, it, it's very tissue damage and it, it does some bad stuff to you but this guy, oh, 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 I knew he, oh, there it is. There's the bite. Oh. Here we go. He's going to hit it again. Nope. Okay. That, that mouse is already, yep, he's done. He is showing signs. He is, yeah. Oh, no, he's got some fight left in him. But he's definitely envenomated. But. The interest uh, before I got sidetracked here, but let me tell you, um, there is extensive studies going on right now with this. Oh, 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 and he hung on, and he hung on. Oh, that was cool. Oh my goodness, what a fierce predator! Oh my God, he is a fierce little snake, ain't he? Oh my goodness. Oh. That was, that was crazy cool. You know, and there's no need for us to breed these things in captivity. I mean, there's millions of them. We can go out and collect 20 of them tonight if the lab needed them. Yep, I knew it. I knew he would kill that thing and eat it. How cool is that? See what good hardy captives captives that they make. They make really good captives. Now that moccasin, he wouldn't eat this mouse. He, I'm gonna tell you right now, if I threw a live mouse in there with him, he might bite it and kill it, but he wouldn't eat it. He will not eat it. If I had a fish, he would eat a fish. But we'll send this little guy out with a full belly. <laughs> that mouse actually was bleeding from the nose. Um, yeah, that's the hemorrhagic component in that venom, the hemotoxin, but what a fierce little predator. And what's interesting is the name Echistrodon, you know, just like with the Echistrodon complex. Now that 
that contributes to, you know, the copperhead, the cottonmouth, both species. Now, a keisternon in 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 uh in Latin, it it means literally a hooked tooth or curved tooth. And contoratrix, which that's what this is, the keisternon contoratrix, contoratrix, um, it literally means um complex or twisted, complex or twisted pattern. Just kind of referring to this snake's patterning, you know, the hourglass chevrons and and copperheads are variable they can be really broken up in pattern and very complex and but that didn't amaze me i knew this guy would tag that thing and take it right down they're actually pretty ferocious they do really well in captivity but we'll put this guy back out in the wild tomorrow with a full belly <laughs> he came in and did his job he performed at venom central now you can see him rattling his tail a little bit. That means he's kind of upset. He knows I'm standing right over him. But he's eating. He ain't going to pass up a meal. Now a really interesting fact. That there's some studies going on right now. With... This actual snake, this actual species, okay, the Keisterdon contortrix contortrix, the southern copperhead. There is some studies happening right now with this snake's venom, okay? And they've found a protein in this snake's venom called contortrostatin. I, I think that's how they pronounce it, contortrostatin. But anyways, this protein that they discovered in this snake's venom it's actually halting the growth of cancer cells in mice. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, it's stopping the growth of cancer cells. I mean, that's incredible. And it's also stopping the migration of tumor growth in lab mice. So, who knows? Someday this snake's venom just may help stop cancer. Man, that feeding was cool, wasn't it? Oh, he's a fierce little predator. I mean, I knew he'd eat. I knew he would do it. Hey, and by the way, Rattlesnake X, a lot of you guys were close, okay? But to tell you the truth, this is exactly what that snake is uh, comprised of, okay? It is made up of a bat wing. Now, a bat wing is a Eastern Diamondback and a Canebrake or a Timber Rattlesnake hybrid, okay? And we call them bat wings. But this one is a percentage thing. Now, this snake is literally a bat wing father to a southern timber canebrake mother, okay? And it came out so unique that it got a western rattlesnake look. It looks nothing like its other siblings. It just came out completely oddball. I mean, what a cool rattlesnake. I mean, so it's a percentage thing. If you guys are listening to me, I said it. Percentage thing. To me, it looks like this. It looked like that, but... It's literally, if you do the percentages, it's, it's well, I, I would say a 33 and a third of Eastern Diamondback, and then maybe 66%, uh, however you want to say it, of cane break. So it's just got a little bit of Eastern Diamondback with a lot of cane break. But it doesn't look like either of them. <laughs> That's what was so confusing to me. And, but a lot of you guys were close, but nobody hit it dead on. But uh, anyways, if you guys are new to the channel, hit the V logo and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. And don't forget Miss Dina's channel. Go check out The Reckoning. You guys don't want to miss this information. Trust me. It's important stuff. And she's very passionate about it. Show her some love. And come on back to Venom Central. This is Willie checking out. Later.